أجمعين شلون لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد. Last night's class was just supposed to be your night. The night will bring some benefits from the teachings of the Imam of Yemen, Abi Abdul Rahman Mufid Ibn Had Al Wadi, who died in 1421 Hijri. Which is equivalent to 2001 Gregorian on the rules of calendar. He was from the Imams of our time of Ahlul Sunnah, of the <coughs> Kitab and the Sunnah, on the, as he used to say, Ala Fahm al Salaf al Salih, the way that the first three generations understood and carried the Quran, the Sunnah that they learned from the Prophet وسلم, and the companions. But because of some circumstances we had with the transportation and so forth, the class was canceled. So I may leave it on tonight. I may leave it on Saturday rather than Friday night, rather than move it back to Friday. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, Allah give us something. Mm -hmm. Last night's class was going to talk about three things. As the class before, I talked about maybe three things. And I try to make them in the same topic same area. So tonight is going to be about medicine, the Tadawi. As we know, medicine has different aspects to it. You have physical medicine, something you can take by mouth. You have physical medicine, something you take by rubbing. You have physical medicine that you can use as it relates to injections. You also have medicine with regards to spirituality things you can say, prayers, different methods. And some of them are okay, some of those methods are not. So medicine, tonight's topic is going to talk about spiritually as it relates to reading Quran and other applications such as uh, prayer or putting your hand on somebody, part of the body that aches and praying, reading, standing over them or sitting over them can you also um, treat somebody's spiritual or physical sickness with Quran? It's a big debate. Can you treat somebody's physical or spiritual sickness with Quran? That's a big debate. Some say only spiritual, physical, you gotta go to a physician or a herbal doctor. Others say, who said that you can't use Quran for both physical and spiritual when Allah said it's clear um, uh, shifa, it is a any treatment and a uh, medicine uh, for the human being. Then you have also can you um, treat animals that are sick? The animals actually funny. Can you read Quran with the animal? A cow, a sheep, a camel, a cat. We can also add a dog, some people have dogs. Then you have, can you also treat someone's sickness by putting something in writing? Like you have something hanging on the wall, you have something now, today is printed, you don't write it out. So you have a, a card that you hang on your uh, wall or you tie a string around it, they make a thing you wear around your neck, or some people, they put it in the car, it's hanging on the rear view mirror. Can you do that? That's another question. Can you physically say the words of something to drink, like you take this cup and say, Can you do that and drink it? And also, what the Sheikh said about using narcotics, drugs, or medicine when a person is going to have a major surgery. So those are the points for Mobile Night for tonight. The first one we'll take as it relates to the last one that we mentioned, narcotics, because the other three are dealing with Rukia, as they call it. Rukia means to yani, Rukah to read words. And again, we said this type of method 
is either halal, okay, or haram. Because you can say some words that are shirky acts. They have shirky. Of course, that's going to be halal or haram. 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 Now, of course, you can say some words that a person does not understand nor trust that you're saying something that's okay to them in a language. Would that be halal or haram? If I'm saying in a language, you don't know. Number two, right. you don't know it, but you don't feel comfortable either me saying it because you got a bad feeling that I'm saying something that's not right or something that's, you know, evil or wicked. Would that be okay to treat somebody reading like that or not? No. Yeah, right. Right. As I said, the person must understand what you're saying. They said, too, if they don't understand what you're saying, they must feel comfortable and confident that what you're saying is okay. And we have this many times. People don't understand Arabic, but he knows that's the Imam. He knows that's the Sheikh. He knows enough Quran to know, okay, and that's Quran. I know that Surah. I don't know all the words and the meanings, but I hear that enough. That's Quran. Then if the person says, Yabba Dabba Duba, somebody knows that's not Quran. Like, what the hell was that? <laughs> so, first has to feel comfortable. So, the first thing we're going to deal with the narcotic. The Sheikh, he said, Sheikh Mubin, he was asked, is it okay uh, for a person to use narcotics, drugs, when they have amalia? Amalia is an operation because, you know, you're in pain. You need something to numb the pain. You need something to calm the body. You need something to calm the bleeding down when you go through a, a, a operation. The Sheikh was asked, is it okay to use drugs or the word in Arabic, mukhadrat, narcotics, for somebody who's going to do operation or receive the operation? It's okay for them to receive those narcotics because of the surgery. They said that if this is the case, then how do you combine between that permissibility? They said the aura. The aura means you have a need. The word barura, you have a need. Anytime there's a need in Islam, even if that thing is wrong in its origin, it may become okay because you have no other choice. So they ask the shape it when it comes to necessity and someone getting a surgery, can he receive narcotics? Can he receive drugs because of the pain and to help with the operation? And if the sheikh says, yes, it's okay because of necessity for Rora, then how do you understand the hadith of the prophet that is narrated by Umar Salama when she said, Inna Allah la ja'ala shifa li ummati ma yani ma harramaha yani al kamaqa that the Prophet Salam was supposed to have said the Hadith Umm Salama that Allah will never make a cure in something. In Allah la ja'ala shifa fi ma haram Allah li ummati. That Allah will never make a treatment, something that you use to cure sicknesses with something that he already told you is haram. The Shaykh he replied, he said, as for that Hadith, then there's this hadith has in the chain of person by the name of Shara uh, ibn Hoshib. Shara ibn Hoshib, yani the prophet uh, in this particular narration, the chain of narrations, there's a person named Shara ibn Hoshib. Sheikh Mukbil said, this person, the scholars, they have a, a debate about him. Some said that he's da'if. He said before da'if, meaning that person can't be in the chain of transmission. If he's in the chain of transmission, the hadith is unacceptable. That's the best way to understand da'if. This person shows up and the transmission of who said what, going back to the companions of the prophet, if that person from his shape, from his shape, from his shape, from his shape, oh, shayb in the house Hadith is da'if. Sheikh Mubil, he said, however, raja anna, he said, but the strongest of the two arguments is that it is da'if because most scholars say that 
that narrated, yani, he is Daif. Yani, he is a person that uh, he, he, kedab, he has been uh, accused, and most of the time when they speak to that, there's some evidence that the person is lying. Because you could say a person is lying, but what's your proof? And the shape oftentimes mentioned that someone has an um, envy with you. He doesn't like you. He can say, man, that guy, he's a liar. This is the porn that you can slam. But most of the time, the scholars make that call on a person that's a whole history, a whole uh, they file they have on that person to prove where he or she lied and why and the reasons. And sometimes, you know, uh, it's un unanimously uh, um, agreed he is a liar. So that hadith of Umar Salama, where it was stated that the Prophet said that Allah will not place a treatment or a cure in something that Allah has made haram for the Prophet's Ummah, that hadith is Daif Sheikh Muslim said. So therefore, and there's another wording where the Prophet was supposed to have said, and this also is the wording of Shaykh ibn Hoshif, where he said, Khamar wa Mukhadrat, that which is intoxicants from wines and narcotics. Sheikh said the hadith, Shaykh ibn Hoshif is in the chain, and this hadith is Daif. It's Daif meaning that person chains to sit alive, so that doesn't count. So the Sheikh said, therefore, if a person has a necessity, Sheikh Mukbil, for an uh, operation, then to use the doctors to give him and minister some, you know, hardcore drugs. Because the operation, he said, there's nothing to prevent that. There's nothing to say that it's wrong. And that necessity does not conflict or authentic hadith because that hadith that they mentioned, that is the hadith of his wife, Umm Salama, that the Prophet made that statement in that chain of Shari ibn Hoshif, and that hadith, Sheikh Muslim, he said, is Daif. Therefore, if you're going to get an operation, the doctors give you morphine, they give you this, that, nobody can say, I feel haram, or you're at home, swole all up, aching, your pain is a 10, a 9 and a half, I feel, be patient, you can't take that haram, you gotta be crazy. If you don't give me the mm -hmm. bike, then you got it, quick. <laughs> so that was the question that the Sheikh was asked who was taken first in the section of tip of the call, medicine and the issue of treating sicknesses by reason. The second one, is it permissible um, to uh, do rupia? Because some people, they said you cannot yeah, I need uh, read over a person. The Sheikh said there's no um, text to prevent that. And uh, we see that the Prophet himself, when he was tested with magic, was sick for six months with magic. The Jewish man uh, by the name of Labib ibn Asim, he sent one of the young girls that would go visit Aisha to bring some hair from the Prophet's comb. The girl didn't know why. He just said, bring me some of the prophet's hair. She figured, like, it's a good deed. He wants some of the prophet's hair, his blessed hair. She got it out of the comb. Aisha didn't know. Took her to the Yahudi man. He took the hair, said some evil spell words on it, and the hair of the prophet. Put it in some cloth, tied the cloth up. Then he put it in the bottom of a well. We mentioned this in the class when we were doing Kitab Tahara that if there is a well and the water is running, even if you have trash at the bottom of the well, so as long as the water is flowing, then that water can still be used. But this was a broken well that was not operational, no water, people would throw trash in it. So he threw the cloth with the hair of the prophet in it, with the spell on it, and that, thinking who would look in there to find it? Because one of the ways you remove the magic you find the thing that they use and you destroy it. That's how you get the magic off. And that's why it's so hard to remove magic, although you can, it's hard sometimes, such a task, because you gotta find the claw. If someone wants to put magic on, for example, Adam Bilal, myself, they get this Yani Wutra, this headscarf. They get a t-shirt. It has my body chemistry. Everybody has the body chemistry. Sometimes you can smell something say, wow, this stinks, it's sweaty. Sometimes you smell say, oh, this smells like it's been worn. Sometimes it smells like the, the oil, the cologne you wear. Everybody has a body chemistry. Some different smells than others. 
If they get that claw, the gent smells it, he comes to find it. Just like a dog, if he sniffs the, the boot or the pants or the shirt, he'll come and hound you out. That's how the gent is. So that's why you always look for a piece of clothing, a piece of your hair or something. And so the young girl took that back and that Jewish man put the magic on the prophet for the magic didn't allow the prophet to forget something in the religion, to mess up the revelation, to change what Allah gave him because he couldn't remember or his mind. His magic creates all kinds of problems. But, you know, they said, I should say people think I have to take a shower because, you know, I have relations. And so, no, you don't have relations. That part was affected, like, you know, as it relates to the Prophet Sallam. But religiously, revelation, salah, what Allah said, it didn't yeah, he bother that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angels down and told him to, yeah, he, uh, told them to tell the Prophet to read these surah, surah al-Ikhlas, surah al-Falaq al-Nas. And for each one of the ayat in each one of those surah, then part of the spell was broken until the Prophet Sallam was cured from the magic. So Sheikh said, this hadith proves that you can read yeah, I need to remove yeah, I need omens, magic, spells, and there's nothing to prevent that. We should add that again, it should be words that are free from shirk. Can't say something, oh God, remove this spirit, remove this demon from this person. I ask you, oh Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. That would be impermissible. Why? Shirk. Shirk. Piggy shirk. We cannot say, uh, remove these omens from this person and cast them out by our ancestors. That would be permissible or impermissible? Impermissible. Why? Because it's not possible. I mean, it's incorrect. Uh, Why? Quickly. Shirk. Sure. Sure. How's the shirk? Sure? Ancestors. He prayed to the ancestors. Yeah, because Allah said to worship to him. Yeah, but. So she no partner. Yeah, but why is it wrong? Because you're praying to the ancestors. Yeah. This is part of people got to understand. Why is it true? Okay, Allah said it, but why? Because you're praying to somebody who's other than Allah. Point blank. You're seeking assistance from the deceased. This is shirk, but you got to know what is the shirk. Many times we say shirk, but we don't know what is the shirk. And then we might go and make that shirk. Why? Because we don't understand what is the shirk. We say shirk. So shirk here is... Ask your prayer to who? The end? Ancestors. So this is the, the, the be free from shirk, from kufr, these different things, and there should be something that the one who's being read over understands, or he should feel she should feel comfortable yani, with what you say in another language like this. Now, Tayyip. The second question for Rukia, the Sheikh was asked, is it permissible to read over animals? Such as cows, sheep, yani, and, uh, camels. I'm going to add cats. People have cats. Dogs. People have dogs. Although the Prophet Sallam, he said, yani, in Ashad al Nas, Yuadribuna, Yom al Qiyama, Aladina Yasid Naruna, has his sword. Those who have the from amongst those that will be severely punished on the Day of Judgment, those who make images. So this person, he makes uh, draws. Here the Sheikh is talking about, so the Prophet is saying, the image that has a soul in it. So you make an image of a live human being, you're going to be punished on the Day of Judgment. What is the situation now with digital cameras and yeah, any video? Some scholars include that as a general yeah, any issue of an image. Not every scholar agrees because it says that this is from satellites and different things of technology. It's not really writing, drawing an image with ink or pencil. But others like Sheikh Mufti, he said, no, it's inclusive. Just like you use your hand to draw it, you use your finger to push the button, the Sheikh said it's the same. But not every person takes that opinion like myself, Yani, Allah most time. The point is, if you make images of a human live soul, then the prophet said that person will be the most severe punishment of judgment. And he said, uh, 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 u
Yeah, and he comes in one last four. And angels do not enter a house where there are dogs and images. But sometimes the people that have dogs, even though they are Muslim, little French poodle, long most time. What's that dog look like? A hot dog? It's real long. It's a cute dog. They put a sweater on and a hat. Is it permissible to put a sweater and a hat on a dog, a little cute dog or a cat? Dress it up? Some scholars said, no, this is the army. It's wrong. You're wasting. Because they already have a coat. Allah already made them with hair and stuff for the women. Why would you waste money you're going to put a little hat? Oh, that's cute. Sweater. Lama <laughs> style. But the point is that if you have a dog in the house purposely, if you have a dog in the house on accident, the angels won't enter that house. And if you have, the scholar said, this means hanging. If you have images, your grandmother, your great grandmother, your aunt, your sister, your siblings, your children, your wife, you have them, but you have them in a photo album. And the photo album, the book, it's a book of pictures. Turn the pictures. It's closed. Then it's not open, it's not exposed, it's not hanging. You put it in a drawer, you put it in the closet. Many scholars said that's sufficient. It's the context of the hadith is to have it hanging. Angels won't enter. If you have that and you have the dog, like in the hadith of the Prophet of the So at this point, the Sheikh was asked, is it okay to do okay, read over animals? And they said, yeah, and they said there's cows, camels, and yeah, and I added horse, because people have horses back then, this time. Cats, we have cats, and people have dogs. Whether it's halal, haram, if it's a guard dog, a pet. The point is, if you find the animal acting strange, you know, spiritually, you can read over the animal. Put your hand on the animal's head, read some Quran, or hold the animal, sit by and read them like this. Permissible. Next question the Sheikh was asked about the Rukiyah. The Sheikh was asked, Sheikh Mubir Rahimahullah Ta'ala, is it permissible to treat spiritual ailments, sicknesses, which says the evil eye, eye, omens, I mean, uh, superstitions and curses, because omens are used for a lot of things in English. Magic, black, white, green, whatever, voodoo. Is it permissible to treat that by having something on, like writing, or you know, saying it in something you drink? The Sheikh said he doesn't know any authentic narration from the Prophet as it relates to um, the issue of the person reading in the drink. Reading in the drink, the Sheikh said there's no authentic narration from the Prophet. There is some narration from ulama, like Imam al Bani said, that goes back to the Tabi'in. They will drink, um, read in the water, read in the drink, some Quran. So the fact they have seven times, for example, put the eye in the cat, you want three times, for example, put the eye in the cat, three times, for example, put the eye in the cat, three times, for example, ma'adha, put the eye in the cat, three times, for example, ayat al-kursi, Allahu la ilaha illahu al-hayy al-qayyub, three times, ayatin, ayatin, surah al-Baqarah, the last two ayat, surah al-Baqarah, يعني واتبوا ما تأتي شياطين على ملك سليمان وما كفر سليمان ولكن الشياطين كفر يعلمون الناس السحر. The ayat was about about sihr. Many of the ayat about magic. يعني and fear own and you drink. Some tabi'in is before they did that. So if I mean the people go here, they do it. As for a narration where the prophet did it, no. But it doesn't mean because you have a narration from the prophet that one of the sellers they did it. Then it is nothing to prevent you. But you can't say it's sunnah. And you can't say I think it's bid'ah. Because you have one of the people of the past, they did it. They understood this from the general permissibility of reading, doing ruqya over a person on something to drink. And others also, the issue of writing. The shaykh was asked, can you go by writing? This is a controversial issue. To write the paper, hang it. That's why you see it in the masajid. La Tamilla Illa Muhammad Rasulullah Illa Marahim Ar Rahman Alam Al Quran Ar Rahman Alam Al Quran Alam Al Alam Al Insan Alam Al Bayan Ar Rahman Alam Al Quran Khalq Al Insan Alam Al Bayan All across the top of the ceiling in the masjid, so like you know, seven eight ayat, because for them they think this is going to protect the masjid from 
any omen, any gang. Sometimes the people that have them sit again, hanging on the rear, rear, rear view mirror, that hanging is going to protect you from evil, any type of omen, any and shayateen, any type of spell. I mean, sometimes people wear it around the neck. I mean, this is the whole idea of a chain with a law. Yeah, he hanging or la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, like this. Yeah, and Allah Muftan, there's no, the Shaykh just said, he don't advise you to do that. Because the Prophet didn't do it. If somebody was sick, they came to the Prophet, he would read over it. He would say, here, put this on, go take this and, you know, put this on your wall. I'm going to do that, he would read over it. Some of them said that it's okay because it's general Baba life. We don't find the text to do that. I mean, because the healing is in the recitation of the words. The power is in the words being said and heard, not just the presence of the words. Not just the presence of the words. Now, and then the Sheikh Barakallahu Fiko, lastly, he was asked about the issue of uh, getting. Uh, some medicine, is it the obligation or not, our obligation or not to take the medicine, the treatment. And the Sheikh he said, he doesn't know anything to obligate you if a person wants to take medicine, that sh they should remember not to put their trust in the medicine. Put their trust in the law that the law is going to make the medicine work for them and not put their trust in the medicine, neither should they put their trust in the doctor. The doctor is going to make sure that I'm well. The doctor, he's going to heal me. Allah. Allah is going to heal me, but he's going to use the doctor to heal me. Allah is going to heal me. He's going to put healing and cure in this medicine. And, and this is a very important because uh, this is one of the reasons that many people uh, fall into shirk because they put their trust in other than Allah. You put your trust in Allah, but you do something, feeling and thinking and relying that Allah is going to make through that action a way for you to achieve what you need to achieve. And in this case, it is a cure or treatment because of some physical or some spiritual ailment. Ailment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to kill us from yeah. all ailments. We ask Allah yeah. wa ta'ala to give us shifa yani from every sickness, spiritual, physical, mentally. We ask Allah wa ta'ala for his help, for his mercy. And we ask Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and reward uh, Imam Imam Mokbil with Hajj as well that you for that which yeah. he contributed to Islam and the Muslim Hatta Rasulullah Sadaq and the Madina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam and tasleem and kabira wa alhamdulillah wa alameen Any questions around the topic? Yusuf is here normally he's got some high power questions I can put on my kufi when he's here <laughs> And they used to say, put in your thinking cap. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no question we can think of. Okay. Ma'am. He stepped out. Alhamdulillah. We want to mention something that's connected and then we'll close. One of the um, issues when we talk about, again, the using the Quran, many people that said, in this day and time, if a person has something, he or she is not sure what it is, but they know something is not right with their body. The way they feel, it may be, I mean, that they have some I mean, thing that's um, strange. They may not feel I mean, totally um, energetic. They may feel tired. They may feel uh, a real low sense of spiritual power. And they said, yeah, you go to a doctor first. Go to a physician. Don't just say, okay, let me go to the sheikh, the imam that I trust, that I know, let him read over me. They said, no, go to the professional first. Let them do a checkup, see if something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you, they treat you khalas. Don't go to the extreme of seeking or allowing some Ruqiyah, spiritual reading of Quran and Hadith and Dua first, go to the physician. And then others, they said, what prevents you from that? It's general. 
said the Kabbalah was Allah mentioned that he has put Yani Shifa, Yani in the Quran, and that it is a source of Yani Mutama'ina, comfort, tranquility for the believer. So some that said doesn't make a difference what it is. You read, and they give examples. You know, people were stung. The hadith in the Sahih Muslim, the guy who was stung by the scorpion, they didn't go and get like some medicine that's now. He let them do rupi. And the hadith Abu Sayyid Khudri, he read al Fatiha, the king went away. And somebody might say, well, but I feel in this day and time, you shouldn't do that. But some scholars said, no, get you a cast if you break your leg, but also still read over the leg that has the cast on it. This is where you're doing both. You're getting some uh, conventional medicine from a professional, a way to fix the broken leg, but you read the Quran over. They said, because a lot of times, what we don't know and what we don't understand or that we may miss is that the cause of you falling and breaking your leg, the cause of it behind it, somebody put the iron on you. Somebody didn't like you or wanted bad for you, and they wish something happened to you, you put a bad spell or curse, and then you broke your leg. So you got the, 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 the thing and then the teaching. The thing and the product that came, the result of the action. What is the day? The envy. The envy. Somebody dislike what you have, dislike what Allah gave you, dislike you, then they have the iron. You want something bad to happen to you. You didn't make your dua, you didn't make your dhikr, you was out of yeah, I need the protection of Allah. You didn't pray on time. You did some ma'asi that opened you up, or you were negligent. Boom! You broke your leg. But behind is not just, I broke my leg. Something spiritual is behind that. So they said, yeah, I mean, yeah, get cast on the leg, but read over the leg with the cast. Let somebody read, do the work. Now, nah, and this is what lies a good, uh, the, uh, a good perspective. A good approach for life. Because a lot of times the sickness, like now you find a lot of people having cancer. Young people dying from cancer. He's got cancer here, then it spread here, then it spread there. It's in his lungs, it's in his kidneys, it was in his stomach. It spread like this in three or four months. He was healthy in his 40s, early 50s, 30s. A lot of times because somebody put the iron on that person. person put some magic. I remember, and then we'll close. A person, this was about. Allah Musta'an, Allah Musta'an, and Amin Muhammad, maybe 13 years ago. A brother, he had some lumps. He let me feel it. He said, feel it, Shane. Had some lumps in his side. He went to the doctor. The doctor said nothing was wrong with him at first. They don't know what it is. They read all kind of tests, all type of, you know, blood work. They couldn't come up with a, a reason what these were and why. They just knew it was some type of, you know, um, lump or some type of hardness in his side, a couple of like different places. Then someone told him, go to the sheikh. They took him to a person in the, I think it was in the, uh, the end of the Bronx. And this person was a Moroccan, mashallah. Allah bless him, protect him, he, he courted him. But he was known for doing work. He had a little apartment inside of a, like a three family, four family. Uh, a building, and he would let put, put the people in his kitchen, small kitchen on the floor, and do wuki. He have this like little operation. Muslim, non-Muslim, German, uh, 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 Jamaican, Asian, African American, you name it. White, he was doing. It. Everybody loved him. So he went to the sheikh. The sheikh read over him. He said, "Don't go to that doctor." Then he went back to the doctor anyway. Doctors changed their mind. They said, "Yeah." We're going to run some more tests. They ran some tests. They said, you know, these lumps, they're cancerous. We're going to have to do operation. We're going to have to cut them. So we went back to the sheikh, told the sheikh, and the sheikh said, man, I told you, don't go to them people. Don't you let them cut on you. Well, lie. He said, this is from your Ali. Someone put in the iron on you and some magic. That was him. So the sheikh started treating him. Doing the rope here. He was getting better. The lumps were getting smaller. And then the sheikh told him, go get seven eggs, boil them, bring the eggs back to me in the week. The sheikh was going to do some reading over the eggs. 
he was going to eat the eggs, and the deal was supposed to be done. He never got the seven eggs and never went back to the shoot. Years later, years later, like about eight or nine, I talked to this person who found me on the Facebook. He told me he had the operation. He lost so much weight. He's so sickly. This, that. He lost his family. A lot of stuff happened to him. His wife and so much he lost his job. He said he wished he would have followed the advice of the sheikh. Subhanallah. Young brother. He was deep, too. I won't say his name because he didn't give me a break. But he was, he was strong, healthy, young. Lost my son. So the issue of rope day of life, people argue these days, back and forth debate. You know, they're talking about anybody could just say you have a problem and all they know is rope day rope. No, you shouldn't jump to conclusion. Every single thing is a gem. Every single thing is for shaitan. Every single thing somebody put something on. No. But you shouldn't dismiss the issue. Let somebody diagnose it. Let somebody check it. And sometimes you know the most about your body, how you feel. Now you don't want to pray. And you used to pray. You used to love the dhikr. You used to love the salah. Now you find difficult when the adhan is called, the palma, finding spirituality, getting up to pray. You're lazy. You don't want to pray. You don't want to do certain acts of obedience. But you used to do those acts of obedience. Now it's extra, extra hard to do it. That's a spiritual problem. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Every time it's time to pray, you could sit for hours, watch TV, watch this movie, listen to this, that. You don't yawn, you don't get tired. As soon as it's time to pray, you're going to yawn 30 times, 15 <laughs> times. Ooh. You can't get through a fast time. Ooh. That's an that's a issue of I need. No doubt. I know firsthand from experience, from youth, teachers, other people, that's an issue of spirituality. Somebody put something on. You got gas. You're not a person who ate something that makes you belch and pass when. And, and then some people have that because their body, you know, they, He's overweight, she's overweight. Sometimes they bring you that. But you're not that type of person. You got so much gas, you can't figure out what gave you gas. I mean, you belching, belching, belching. Fart and fart and fart and fart and fart. It's a problem, man. Guarantee you something spiritual. Now, these, these real issues, you know what I'm saying? And the combination of seeking conventional medicine and combining both here, this is a good, good, good advice. From the Sheikh who mentioned this from uh, Egypt a lot most time, but the point is that these issues are real. We ask for Kabbalah for what God protect us from Kulli Shaitan and yeah, from yeah, every yeah. wicked Shaitan. I mean, Kulli Mada Hamma, I mean, Kulli Kulli Ayn and Lamma, from every evil eye and every omen. Allah most time. Allah was also taken on the Dina Muhammad. Thank you. 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 Thank you